Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Last night we played your interview with President Trump from Helsinki. Part of that interview has made headlines today. People are upset about it. It has nothing, by the way, to do with Vladimir Putin or Mother Russia. It has to do with the nation of Montenegro, which, by the way, is smaller than the state of Connecticut. Montenegro has fewer residents than the District of Columbia. It's a relatively poor place. It has no critical natural resources and limited strategic significance. Few Americans could find it on a map or name its capital or its president. That's not a slur against Montenegro. Apparently, it's a nice place, but those are the facts about Montenegro. From an American perspective, it's not an important country. And yet suddenly, because of an act of Congress that few people noticed, Montenegro has profound significance to every American. Since last year, Montenegro has been a member of the NATO alliance. That means that if Montenegro ever finds itself in a war, our military is pledged to defend it. That's called a defense guarantee. Defense guarantees don't seem like a big deal until suddenly they are. That's how the First World War started. 37 million casualties later, the world began to rethink the wisdom of treaties like that. But the lesson seems to have been lost since. In our interview with President Trump in Finland, we thought it might be worth having a conversation or starting one about America's obligations to NATO. So we asked a simple question. Why is it in our interest to defend the territorial integrity of Montenegro? Why should our soldiers fight and die on its behalf? Here's the exchange we had. So membership in NATO obligates the members to defend any other member that's attacked. That's so right. let's say Montenegro, which joined last year, is attacked. Right. Why should my son go to Montenegro to defend it from attack? I Why is that? I understand what you're saying. I've asked the same question. You know, uh, Montenegro is a tiny country with very strong people. Yeah, I'm not against Montenegro uh, right. or Albania. No, by the way, they're very strong people. They're very aggressive people. They may get aggressive. And congratulations, you're in World War III. Now, uh, I understand that, the, but that's the way it was set up. So that's not a definitive answer, obviously, but the president clearly had been thinking about it. And good for him. Presidents are supposed to wonder about things like that. Serious countries ought to have debates like that. The U.S. has to defend Montenegro? Really? Why is that? Is there a good reason? Let's hear it. That's the conversation we should be having. But the guardians of our public conversation are not serious people. They are hacks and buffoons. For wondering about our defense guarantee with Montenegro, Trump is being denounced for treason. For asking the question, we're accused of taking orders from Vladimir Putin. What do the Russians have on Tucker Carlson? Asked longtime CNN star Kathy Griffin. Her former network did an entire segment this afternoon suggesting that Americans somehow have some sort of moral obligation to lay down their lives for Montenegro. Here's part of it. Yet again, raising serious doubts about whether he would honor Article 5 of the NATO Charter, if it came down to it, it's a cornerstone of the alliance. An armed attack on one nation is an attack on all. This time the president questioned whether the United States should honor its agreement when it comes to NATO's newest member, Montenegro. So the argument apparently is that because Montenegro has about 20 non-combatants in Afghanistan right now, we, the U.S., has an eternal obligation to spend American money and lives defending Montenegro's borders. That is idiotic, which is to say perfect for cable news. In real life, a defense guarantee is not something you'd enter into lightly. It's like promising a friend to take care of his kids if he dies. It's a solemn commitment, and you would not make it unless you planned to keep it. So the question is, do we plan to keep it? Do we really plan to defend Montenegro or many of the other NATO members? How about Estonia? How about Slovakia? You ready to have your kids die in those countries? The U.S. government is ready to send them. We've promised to do that. NATO was created almost 70 years ago for a specific and noble purpose, keeping the Soviets from invading Western Europe. It worked, thank God. But the Soviet Union no longer exists, and it hasn't existed for almost 30 years. NATO, meanwhile, is still around, and it's getting bigger. Why is that? And more to the point, is it serving America's interests, or is it imperiling them? Those are vital questions. Official Washington does not want to answer them or talk about them. They're trying to crush anyone who asks. We are not intimidated, obviously. Joining us tonight is Philippe Reigns, the former Hillary Clinton spokesman. Earlier today, he suggested we were working for Vladimir Putin for daring to ask about NATO and Montenegro. So it's a, it's a really serious question mm -hmm. because defense guarantees are serious promises. Why would the United States promise to defend Montenegro? Well, 
The NATO treaty has kept the peace for since World War II. I don't want your son to fight in Montenegro. I don't want your son to fight in Germany or any other of the 29 NATO countries. But you are presenting NATO as something likely to trigger a war when NATO, in fact, has been what has avoided war. And while the Soviet Union has fallen, the Russians are incredible. I know when I say Russians, we... The reason I brought up Montenegro, and you suggested there was some... Putin related reason that I did, but there was a much more prosaic, obvious reason for bringing it up, which is it just joined NATO. Yeah. And so at what level is a country not big enough to fight for? And let's also remember, well, I don't know what's the the American interest that would be preserved by sending my son to go fight in Montenegro. It's a serious question. I I told I saw your I saw your interview last night. And I thought answer speak slowly so I can understand (laughs) the answer is. NATO and the and the collective defense, as it's called, which you know, is the most likely thing to keep the peace than not. But I mean, let's European, say if there's no peace. But hold on, let's say that Russia moves against Montenegro. I, I'm not hoping for that. I hope they don't. But they might. Why would a critical American interest be served in going to, to war over that? At what? point is a country big enough. Well, how about this point? How about Montenegro? I mean, it's very, that's why I gave a very specific example. Well, you diminished their contribution I'm not, to look, Afghanistan. I'm not you, attacking them. I think it's great <laughs> that they've got 20 non-combatants in Afghanistan, I guess. Actually, I feel sorry for them. I don't think we should have... Well, they've contributed even before NATO. That's great. But that's not the point. Are you suggesting that we owe them a defense guarantee because no, they're I, participating I'm, I'm, in I'm, Afghanistan? I'm not looking at Montenegro itself. I'm looking at the full 29 countries that well, make I know up that, NATO. That's, that's how bad decisions get made when people don't look at the specifics. No, that's no, why I am looking at the specifics. No, be, well, this, here are the specifics. How many times has the collective... Okay, once. Once, and when was that? It was after 9-11. And it was a sign of uh, solidarity. I think it's, I think it's great. It's never this happened. This is not 9-11. I think you... The World War This World is not War Archduke Ferdinand. ...actually happened. I know. It's not. It's merely... Look, the fact is that we are obligated to defend all these countries. Slovakia, Albania, Turkey. What would happen if Israel attacked Turkey? That's not a crazy possibility. You could easily see a terror group, Hamas, whatever, backed by Turkey... Israel retaliates. Suddenly, we're obligated to attack Israel. How and would it's that not work? Not every exactly? time fire anyone fires a shot at no, anyone it's not. else that it's we not. go to war. But otherwise, could, we would have been in eighteen wars in the last you, fifty years. Could you imagine a scenario? No. Where is I easily could. No. I easily. Oh, we, really? We, we would no, never be in a shooting war with Israel. Of course, we wouldn't be. But under the terms of Article Five, you could see an obligation. But the terms to be, have and never that's the been triggered okay, because but, the point of the terms. Are to keep the peace, and it has been successful. Okay, but here's is Montenegro here's the tipping a, point between a, NATO no, working and here's not? Here's just a newsflash. Yep, the intent of something is not always consistent with the results of it. In other words, we do things hoping for one outcome, and very often get an entirely different outcome. And that's why we need but to we've enlarge had, our minds and imagine what could happen when we start making. But we didn't just create NATO yesterday. No, we didn't. We, we created NATO decades we, ago, we and we know the history. It. So what's the point? What is? I mean, let's be really specific. So NATO was created to keep we have, the Soviets we have from invading expanded Western. NATO, the original NATO, which I believe was twelve countries, was to keep the Soviet Union in check. Correct. That's right. From invading Europe. Western Europe. Great goal. Which which, by the way, has worked really well. Amen. I totally agree. Europe was war-torn for since the beginning Couldn't of Europe. Couldn't agree more. I love NATO. I grew up Something loving NATO. Something is working. Okay. Something got no, us through the, the Cold War. but the world has completely changed. So maybe the people in Washington are so ossified and dumb, which is true, <laughs> that they're failing to account for the total realignment of everything. The world is completely different from what it was in August of 91 when the Soviet Union disappeared. So are you saying that Montenegro shouldn't be part of it? Or I'm NATO saying, should stop? I'm saying we should pull out of NATO. I'm, I'm not saying we should pull out of NATO. I'm saying so we should have point, an adult conversation. I don't know who number 28 was, but So who, but you're making impossible with reckless charges of treason the conversation America needs, which is, what is the point of this? Is is the main adversary we face in the world stage I, I don't Russia? believe Donald Trump no. bumping into the president of Montenegro several months no. ago was any kind of code how message. far does this? I mean, like, what is it the was? Point? I think people picked up on it because there was only a one in twenty-eight chance but, of picking I mean, Montenegro. So, but what you're Agreed, doing but is that's preventing. Not the point. Like, I watch but these other the channels point. and they're like, Trump this, Trump that. It's like actually every American voting for Trump or not has an interest in answering the question. What's the point of this? And no one can answer the question. That's not true. I'm, I, I'm trying to answer the question, which is to NATO has safe. been part of our own defense. It is not. You're giving me a history lesson. I want to know about. But right the history now. is relative. I mean, if you don't learn from. So history, they're going to prevent you're... Russia from doing what? Russia is. Russia is. I know you hate when I say it, but Russia is being aggressive. I won't say a word about the election. 
Russia is being aggressive again. Russia is being aggressive militarily. So let's say they took Russian over bombers are buzzing us over Alaska. Um, we had right. Russian so, ships oh, and so airplanes NATO menacing us. NATO hasn't prevented any of that. It's kind of How weird. How do you know? <laughs> I don't know. You're saying that Russia's so. Bottom line, maybe they are incredibly if, afraid of the Montenegrins. But maybe if Russia were to invade one of these countries, do you think? Very simple question. It would be worth your neighbors, my kids, going to fight Russia for the sake of the territorial integrity I mean, of I, I, I don't want to be the Dem that just repeats myself four times, but I firmly believe that it is NATO that has prevented that. No, I, no, in but, four years but, of the but, state... But NATO four times in Belgium. I, I understand. Look, NATO's, again, you should be a history teacher. I'm just asking, like, how about tomorrow <laughs> this happens? Don't you think America there should, have been What events. percentage of Americans Ukraine, think they want their kids to die defending Slovakia? Seriously, big percentage, would you say? I, I don't know. I know that I just outside met uh, Leo and Michelle from Atlanta, Georgia. They're a big uh -huh. fan of yours. And I think that they understand that NATO is important. They might understand why Montenegro. Out, out, yeah, they, they think And they important. might agree that there's a Montenegro meltdown. But outside but, all the dumb people working in nonprofits, the think tank people in charge of our foreign policy who literally are responsible for wrecking the world outside that group of people does anybody think it's worth dying for slovakia not one person well i think people are enjoying the freedom that has been provided <laughs> okay. without having to spend too much time uh worrying about how it's come which is the american way that it should be Philippe, good to see you it is good to be back thank you lou dobbs host of course lou dobbs tonight on fox business one of the wisest people on television he joins us tonight is it do you think lou America's obligation to defend the ter territorial integrity of Montenegro. I, I think that uh, the president is not getting the credit he deserves for, for raising the issue of realigning NATO. Because when, as you worry about whether we will defend NATO, it, it seems to be the, the reaction, uh, at least of, uh, of Philip, that, uh, that uh, NATO has saved the Western, Western civilization. It's really an odd discussion to me in, in this respect, if I may say, Tucker. It, it, the, the president of the United States is the one who, in his campaign, and started talking, the wild, talking about reorienting not NATO. Not before uh, Talking that about pool. the fact you talked Thanks about for Washington being tonight. That's and dumb. Uh, this is a president who came in with bright ideas, uh, who is attacked from every element of the establishment uh, and those who are invested deeply in the status quo, including NATO. Uh, but the, the reality is that there, as we watch cable television today, uh, the folks you were talking about on CNN are really neocons of casual convenience. Exactly. They are just thrilled to be talking about the United States defending uh, the, the poor uh, folks of uh, Montenegro against uh, the onslaught of mad Russians. Uh, this is beyond the pale. And, and the fact is, the real answer lies in we have a president who saw all of this years ago who is driving this discussion because he can't get Congress, he can't get through the national media to the important issues. What is NATO doing? Why are they expanding to 29 nations, many of them small, uh, and, and whether small or large, not particularly responsible in meeting the demands uh, that uh, are, are required of 2% of GDP for defense spending? We, we are actually being called upon to defend all of NATO, irrespective of the money they pay or their own fighting capabilities. Because we deserve it. We have an altruistic obligation to only act when it's not in our interest. Have exactly. you ever noticed that they're very enthusiastic for war, but never wars that might actually benefit the United States? Ever. Any war that we might actually have an interest in, no, can't do that because we're, we're bad. You, you've put it perfectly. We are compelled by some mysterious force to be altruistic to act even against our own national yes, interests. One could right. argue that invading Iraq, as the president has pointed out, and uh, losing all of those lives and losing all of that money in the trillions uh, was not in our interest uh, because really we didn't do much uh, with the people both in Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan who were responsible for September 11th. And exactly. that was the incipient point of the conflict. It is difficult for some to remember. But the president has put it uh, straightforwardly. He wants rationality. He wants things to make sense. He has talked endlessly over the last two years to sometimes no avail that we need yeah. smart government. We need smart people in government. We need brains. We need verb. And we need people committed 
to changing this status quo that could strangle this country as well as Western Europe uh, if we're not careful. Give me a war that protects America and I'll support it. The others Amen, we're brother. supporting. Lou, great to see you. Thank you. Great to see you. Sexist, racist, traitor, Nazi. The left is running out of epithets for the president. What's next? You know what's next? Physical action. We'll break that down after the break. First, he was a sexist, then a racist, then a Nazi, literally Hitler reborn. Now he's a traitor to his country. The left has run out of possible verbal attacks on President Trump. There are none left. All that's left is violence, and some on the left appear to be encouraging that. Progressives have graduated from rhetoric to physical action. For example, congressional candidate Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is calling on progressives to occupy airports and ICE offices to shut down immigration enforcement and keep people from doing their jobs, and people from flying on airplanes, for that matter. Former Hillary Clinton aide Philippe Raines, who was just in our previous segment, has brought air horns to the White House in an attempt to keep the president and his family from sleeping. Congressman Maxine Waters of Los Angeles wants Trump administration officials harassed whenever they dare go out into public. And plenty of regular people seem to be on board with that. That shouldn't surprise you. They have been told for months by the press and by progressive leaders that the president is a Nazi secret agent working for our greatest enemy, Vladimir Putin. If you really believed that, what wouldn't you do? Why wouldn't you use violence to save your country? You probably would. Things might get worse from here. The weather is getting hotter. We've got six weeks to go until September. The midterms are getting closer. Harassment and occupation could easily turn into something far worse. You know what we're talking about. People are being primed for that. And the left is recklessly egging it on. And they're not even doing it on behalf of the interests of Americans, but literally for the sake of foreigners. The Montenegrins, you must be ready to die for, for some reason. The illegal immigrants, who apparently now have a God-given right to enter this country. Nobody on the left is occupying Purdue Pharma to protest the opioid epidemic. The tens of thousands of people killed by opioids last year were mostly born in America. They don't help big business or get Democrats elected, so they don't matter. Congressman Eric Swalwell represents California, and he joins us tonight. Congressman, what's the penalty for treason? Uh, Tucker, good evening. Uh, you know, the, the, the penalty that we are all paying right now for the president's uh, treason is we are losing our allies. We see a wrecking ball threatening our freedoms uh, here at home. And by the president's own definition of treason, Tucker, let's just use that. What's your, because what, what's, what's your definition of treason? I don't, we're, betrayal. I don't want, betrayal. Betrayal of the American so, people. But, but yep. treason, it, treason's a capital so offense, Why doesn't correct? his definition matter? He's the president. Oh, well, he said I'm, that Democrats I'm, I'm asking you, committed treason when we didn't. Congress. Hold well, on, I'm telling on. you, his, he's the president. He said Democrats committed treason when we didn't stand up for him at the State of the Union. Okay. His conduct in Helsinki My, was beyond it, that. Is treason, is treason. So treason is punishable by death. It's an actual crime. And I think you're an attorney, you would know that. So when you tell your constituents that the president of the United States has committed a death penalty offense, are you concerned that maybe, just possibly, you're torquing up the rhetoric past the point of reasonable conversation? No, I, I'm saying that the president, by its own definition, don't blame the treason. president. Don't blame. Oh, look, he has know, a lot to be blamed for. It's not your job. Tucker. You to should take blame the president's the president. definition. You you're an elected should blame the Hold on, slow down. I want to no, know no, what no, you no. think. Why if do I you just blame interview him? Trump, if I want to know what I he thinks, I'll interview. ask him. I want to yeah. know what you think. You're accusing the president of a capital offense. Why wouldn't it be more useful for the rest of us to explain specifically the policies that you disagree with? And we could have a debate on them. If you think the United States has an obligation to defend NATO members, tell us why. Instead, yeah. he's a treasonous Nazi. You think that's helpful? Oh, oh I, I didn't call him a Nazi, Tucker, but why don't you have a problem that the President of the United States wants to turn over a innocent U.S. ambassador to the Russians? Don't you have a problem? Like, do we draw a line somewhere? Do we want to hear well, the transcript? I have transcript? a problem with a lot of things the president has yeah. said. But well, I'm, asking you you, I'm asking you, who what is you one of the people be? accusing the president of treason, if that's helpful. Yeah. I mean, is that yeah. the kind of rhetoric, again, as an elected official, that you think spurs thoughtful 
constructive conversation that brings the country together, or does it whip the morons into a frenzy and increase the likelihood of violence? Well, honestly, I, like, give me a real answer. Yeah, I, I think this is a beautiful country that has always added freedoms, and we have a wrecking ball president right now. Don't who give is me the working. stupid talking points. No, he's, Just, he's working. He's, so, he's, like, why, why are you doing this? He's working with an enemy, Tucker. Okay. Tucker, working you may not enemy. like the answer. You may not like the answer, but no, but it's just president. dumb. I mean, working with an enemy, Russia's yeah, our Tucker, enemy. What's We're dumb not, is that uh, is that really so the every Republican president who met with is Russia is committing treason. President who went over to Helsinki, had a private meeting, agreed to turn over a U.S. ambassador to an enemy, and sided with them over our own intelligence committee. At what point do you draw a line and say that's not a U.S. president? Okay. That's just the prime minister of Russia defending the president of Russia. What point so do you, you say think that? that the president is more loyal to Russia than the United? I mean, I just. I guess I would just remind you that, again, you're a member of Congress. You're not supposed to talk like a child or make reckless accusations or say things you don't understand or encourage people to commit violence. No, I'm just shocked that you're talking like this. I mean, you don't like the president because you think he's irresponsible. Do you want it to be led by somebody who is siding with the Russians over the United States? Settle down, son. I'm older than you are. Don't call into question my love of the country. Please, come on now. Tucker, please. Let's have a conversation. Private conversation with a dictator. Agreed to turn okay. over a U.S. ambassador, sided okay, with them over take our this own point intelligence let's just, wait, just stop for one second. Yeah. You think it is treasonous for an American president to meet privately with the head of state who we don't get along with. Is that what you're saying? I think it's a betrayal of the United States to side with Russia over our own intelligence community, to agree to turn over a U.S. ambassador to Russia who is innocent, knowing so, what the fate so, of so that ambassador would be. So let me ask you this. Should the, president, should the president meet with the leader of China? Obviously, a dictatorship kills its political enemies, practices censorship, actually has a great deal of censorship it inflicts on American companies. Should he meet with the Chinese premier, or would that be treason as well? If, if we're going to get something out of it. We didn't get anything out Wait, of it. No, no, hold on, hold on. So, so you're saying it is, it is okay because a lot of your constituents get money from China, as we know. I mean, you represent the Bay Area. China pumps a lot well, of money I, I, into— don't, don't insult the Bay Area. I'm not insulting the Bay Area. I'm from the Bay Area. Yeah. I'm just I'm noting a fact, which yeah. is China makes a lot— of your constituents rich. China is a more repressive country than Russia. Russia doesn't censor the internet the way that China does. Yeah. I mean, let's just be real. Let, but you don't have any problem with that country at all, do you? Attack, let's, all let's the focus, freedom stuff doesn't mean focus, squat to you, does it? No, yeah, let's focus on the country that attacked us and the president who met oh. with that dictator right after those indictments came what down. What about the Saudis? Didn't Are you cool with back? us meeting with the Saudis? They behead people. They kill gays. You okay with that? They don't let women drive up until recently. Yeah. You, that's okay with you, though, Tucker, I, I, th I think I see why you want to distract from what the president. I'm not distracting. I'm trying to know what the rules are here. Tucker, Tell me why rules? you're okay with it. Tell me why you're okay with what the president did yesterday. Because I don't with understand meeting, meeting why with, you are. Meeting with Putin? Because Putin is one of no, the why, most powerful said. leaders in the world are militarily. You, are you why okay with what he with said, them? that he sided with Putin? Are you okay with that? He is skeptical of Tucker, Tucker, American don't, don't, intelligence don't, no, no. reports Tucker, that don't that's explain just, their conclusions. Not, don't give me the, tuck, the talking points, Tucker. Oh, Were you okay with point. him that's how I feel siding with it. Russia? Were you okay with him siding, siding with, Russia? with Russia? I'm never okay with an American official siding with the foreign government over our own. Are you okay I with him okay, turning a U.S. ambassador okay over to Russia? I am okay with American leaders meeting with heads of state we disagree with. Are I you okay with him turning you a U.S. Of being ambassador? A traitor if you met with the Saudis or the Chinese, or indeed with Putin, I would like to interview Putin. Does that make me a traitor? What about turning over Ambassador McFaul to the Russians? What do you think about that? They didn't deny that today at the press conference. That is so disturbing. Do you have an opinion on that? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. It sounds like we've, you don't. We've it kind of like run out of time for DNC talking yeah, points, I, but, conveniently, I, but I would just, conveniently, I would, I would, yeah. I would urge you to stop using the term treason because I think it's mindless, and I also I'm think it's I'm using the president's definition, just the president's oh. definition. Well, he, yeah, okay. Thank you, Congressman. Good to see you. My pleasure. Dave Rubin reports the host, rather, the Rubin Report on YouTube, which is excellent, and he joins us tonight. So, Dave, the problem I have with the rhetoric is that it makes any kind of intelligent conversation impossible. I do think that there are real issues at the heart of the Putin-Trump summit. And, you know, you can have whatever view you want on them, but they seem like they're worth discussing. The second you start calling people traitors, accusing them of a felony, uh, how can you talk those issues through? Yeah, well, first off, it's always good to be with you, Tucker, you racist, homophobic Nazi, you. So it's unbelievable. on that note, on that note, um, yes, the, the rhetoric on both sides, but particularly the left, has been ramped up to a point 
where we're basically getting to the place where we will be excusing violence if it's not excused already. Yes. And, and this mob mentality that we've talked about a bunch of times before, uh, it's, it's spreading everywhere. And I, I did a video a couple months back how internet culture is becoming mainstream culture. The, the trolling and attacking and fighting that used to be relegated just to the sort of basement of the internet is now leaking out everywhere and, and our politicians are now telling people to troll people at their homes and, and dox people and all of this awful stuff. I mean, just a great sort of simple example that I can give you is when I was on the car ride over here tonight to do this show, uh, a Hollywood director, actor, producer, great guy who I know who's a lefty who uh, you would disagree with on a ton of stuff, a guy by the name of Mark Duplass, uh, who's a great guy who I've had on my show, uh, who's been reaching across the aisle trying to say to the liberals and the left, you know, guys, let's try to be a little more tolerant. He put out a tweet basically saying, you know, you might want to follow conservative Ben Shapiro. He's a decent guy and maybe it'll open up your eyes to some stuff. I'm, I'm paraphrasing basically. The amount of hate that he got caused the guy to delete the tweet because the mob just goes after anyone that dares say, let's be tolerant. And if that's really where we're at right now, then yeah, what you've been talking about on this show for quite some time about this all escalating to violence. We'll ha if we can't talk, then the only thing left is violence. And I'm doing everything I can to avoid that. I think, right. I think you're trying to do it. And I think there's a bunch of other people trying to do it too. And we've just got to get louder and keep showing people that that's truly the answer here. I hate violence. And if you ever hear me excusing it, I hope you call me on it because it's wrong. Uh, Dave, I, I thank you. I promise you I will. Good, please do. Rand Paul may be one of the very few, is one of the very few lawmakers on either side who sees value in the president meeting with Vladimir Putin. Is he a traitor too? He joins us to answer that question next. Former CIA Director John Brennan is describing the president's summit with Vladimir Putin as, quote, treason. That seems a little over the top, and yet amazingly, many otherwise responsible people have raced to endorse that assessment. We asked the president about it in Helsinki, and here's what he said. Well, I think Brennan's a very bad guy, and if you look at it, a lot of things happened under his watch. I think he's a very bad person. Uh Someone who does not think that the president's meeting with Putin is treason is Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky, and he joins us tonight in the studio. Senator, thanks a lot for coming on. Glad to be here. So the former director of the CIA, you think of that as, as a, as a sober-minded person, a responsible person, kind of a James Bond with maybe an advanced degree. Here you have a naked partisan nutcake describing a press conference as treason. How should that make us feel as American citizens? It makes me wonder whether he should be getting a government pension if he's going to be disrespecting the commander in chief, calling the president treasonous. Um, that's about as over top as you can imagine. But treason is a death penalty offense. <laughs> he's describing views he disagrees with. Well, he yeah. is disagreeing with someone's opinion the same as betraying the country. Well, you have to realize John Brennan started his illustrious career by voting for the Communist Party. You know, that's who he wanted to win the presidency back in the 70s. So he voted for the Communist Party. When he came to be head of the CIA, I filibustered him because I thought he was bad news from the very beginning. And I think what you've seen is, and what should worry us all is, this is one of the most powerful people in the world. Who has the ability to destroy anybody in the world and gain information on anything you do, any American, any foreigner, the head of the CIA? And yet, with all that power, he was coming to work each day with a bias and a hatred of the president. It should worry us all. You know, what other things could he possibly have been doing with that power? So I'm a big believer that we need more checks and balances on those in the intelligence community. James Comey, John Brennan, James Clapper. We need much more surveillance of the watchers. I mean, it's just such an irresponsible thing to say. Look, it's not a defense of the president or any figure to say accusing someone of treason is a very big deal. You kind of wish the Congress uh, were exercising its oversight role more aggressively. I know you're trying. I want to ask you about Montenegro. Um, a consensus has formed in Washington today that America has a moral obligation to protect the territorial integrity of Montenegro. If Montenegro is attacked, Americans have, right. again, a moral obligation to die to protect Montenegro. Right. Do you think that we do? Uh, no. And here's what people who have talked about NATO expansion have said. They have said, 
When you add Montenegro, does that add to our national security or does it actually increase our strategic risk of war? And I think it's more the latter, that when you add a Montenegro or an Albania, or actually we have a resolution before us in Congress right now that I've been opposing that says that anybody in the world who wants to join NATO, anyone who is qualified, can. That means we could have 50, 60 countries. That means we could have Equatorial Guinea in there. And if Mali attacks Equatorial Guinea, somehow we're going to have a world war. Who would back something that lunatic? Uh, well, we had, a, we had a vote, and I tried to strip out the any aspirant could join NATO, and I lost 20 to 1. Every member of the Foreign Relations Committee voted against my amendment, and all my amendment would have done was strip out the section that says that we invite any aspirant to join Do NATO. you believe that the average American has any idea that we are obligated by treaty right. to protect countries that nobody in America can find on a map? Do people right. know that? Nobody knows that, and here's the interesting thing, and this is where the president gets it and nobody in Washington does. People in Washington are unified that everybody should be in NATO. The whole world should be in NATO, even if there were former Soviet satellites. They want to put them in NATO, oblivious of the fact that that could get us involved in World War III. But if you come to Kentucky or you go to Tennessee and you ask average Republicans, average Democrats, do you think we should put every country in NATO and defend every country in the world? Most people would say, hell no, I don't believe that. Because it's insane. Senator, thank you for bringing this to public attention. We should at least have a debate on it. And I know that you're trying to force one. Thank you. Thank you. Well, a U.S. territory has authorized the seizure of guns from private citizens. They said that would never happen. What well, is happening? One congressman is paying close attention and is trying to end it. He joins us next. Just before Hurricane Irma last year, the governor of the U.S. Virgin Islands, Kenneth Mapp, issued a remarkable and disturbing executive order that authorized the seizure of private guns and ammunition from citizens on the islands. The hurricane has been over for nearly a year, but Mapp has continued to renew that order, setting the precedent that Virgin Islands residents can have their weapons seized by the government at will any time. Why is this happening in a territory controlled by the United States? Some lawmakers are asking that question. Congressman Bob Matt represents Utah. He is the chairman of the National Resources Committee, which oversees U.S. territories, and he joins us tonight. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for coming on. This seems like something that couldn't happen in any place controlled by the United States, and yet it is. Why? Well, it ought not to happen. And in fact, ironically enough, after Katrina hit in New Orleans, the mayor tried to do that same kind of executive order. Eventually, the courts ruled that was blatantly unconstitutional. So this is this is the question, and and. And the governor has said different things about it. He, he did issue the order that would have allowed them to confiscate weapons and ammunition. And it says also other property in the law. I don't know how you define that one. But he's also said he never intended to do it. This was merely a, may, a way of getting his National Guard to get ammunition and guns without using the normal procurement system. It's, I don't know what that means. So what it does mean is that our committee, and we are sending a letter with, with uh, Chairman Russia with a couple of guns and a fancy leather jacket. Uh, but today she was wearing an orange jumpsuit and she pled not guilty to charges of acting as an agent of a foreign government. She's going to be held in jail. The judge says that she has no ties to America and therefore she is a serious flight risk, saying that she could hop into any Russian diplomatic vehicle and she would be out of their hands. So the prosecutors say that this 29-year-old allegedly offered to have sex with an unnamed individual in return for a job in the United States and that she gained access to an extensive network of U.S. persons to influence political activities in the United States by living with, uh, and at one point, uh, and none of the people in this picture are implicated in this, so let's take them off the camera, but there is a suggestion that she had a relationship with an individual uh, and may have moved in with someone in order to gain access as well. So here is Jack Barsky, former KGB agent, on the story last night when he asked, when I asked him if he believed that she is indeed a Russian spy. Is she a spy, what we would call a spy? I would think so, albeit most likely an amateur. Calling her an amateur, I also have to compliment her because she got a lot further than I as a trained professional <laughs> got. I mean, she made contact with uh, a whole lot of people that mm. uh, are and, and uh, would be of interest to, to Russia. So that, of course, is what spies try to do. Remember Anna Chapman, 
who even kind of looks a little bit like Maria Butina, and the ring of Russian spies who were caught back in 2010. Their story was the basis for the series The Americans. Michael Isakov is the chief investigative correspondent at Yahoo News and co-author of Russian Roulette. Um, Michael, welcome back to the program. You wrote about Maria Butina in your book. Were you surprised to hear that she had been arrested? Not really. I mean, uh, uh, Maria Butina, by the way, as Butina. I was pronounced, uh, Thank you. has uh, has been on my radar screen and, and a number of others uh, for quite some time. Uh, you know, during the 2016 campaign, she kept showing up at various events. She was uh, uh, photographed with uh, Scott Walker uh, at a uh, NRA event uh, shortly after he announced. And also, uh, and I, we do write about this in declared his candidacy for president. Uh, she showed up at an event uh, he was speaking at in Las Vegas. Uh, Trump called on her during a Q&A session, and she asked about what we his have position that, would let me, be on sanctions. Let me just jump in for one sanctions. second, because we can sure. show that. Let's play that. Sure. Do you want to continue the politics of sanctions that are damaging of both economy? I believe I would get along very nicely with Putin, OK? And I mean where we have the strength. I don't think you'd need the sanctions. I think that we would get along very, very well. I mean, she was clearly doing her job. Uh, she was getting her picture taken her with job. whoever she could. And Right. And look, R Russia sanctions was hardly at the forefront of the American political dialogue at that moment. That's not what Republican candidates uh, were talking much about. But but she got Trump on the record saying he'd do away with sanctions. That was something but President Obama was pressing sanctions at that point, right? Uh, well, he had already imposed yeah. sanctions, yeah. yeah. And, and there's Trump saying, if you elect me, you wouldn't need the sanctions. All right, let, let's talk a little bit about the back channels that she was trying to uh, establish and whether or not, you're, from your reporting, she was able to really get anywhere with that. And part of the investigation is whether or not there was funneling of money. I mean, in, in my mind, she's sort of like the human expression of, you know, of a bot or a tweet or all of the other, other efforts that they made. She's a much more traditional expression of that. In fact, over the last, you know, decade, they've arrested 20 spies who have been doing exactly right. what she was trying to do. Right, right. Look, she was, uh, there, as, as we write in the book, I mean, she surprised a lot of people because she kept showing up mm -hmm. at NRA uh, conventions, at CPAC conferences, at national prayer breakfasts. Um, and, um, you know, there were a number of people who kept wondering, why is this woman uh, always here? What is she after? We, uh, there's a Republican lobbyist who she was sort of coming on to. And this lobbyist was wondering, what's going on here? Why is this uh, Russian woman, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to befriend me and being so Gee, I wonder of, uh, why. Of what I have to I say. wonder what right. she might but possibly <laughs> want. Oh my yeah. God! Yeah. Um, but look, there's a serious part to this story, and that is her handler, her boss, and yeah. that's that guy Alexander Torshin. He is a Russian central banker, deputy governor, was a high-level official in the uh, in the Duma in uh, Putin's party, and an accused money launderer. Um, the Spanish national police had wiretaps on him talking to the head of an or a Russian organized crime gang leader in Spain, in which the leader is talking about him as El Padrino. Torsion is the real target here. Yeah. He's the guy you got to look for. He's the guy in the picture that we're showing right now uh, next to her. Michael, thank you. Good to see you tonight. Sure enough. Anytime. So New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez has been plagued by a scandal and now his New Jersey Senate race is looking like it could actually become a toss up. And 58 concert goers massacred, hundreds of people injured, and now Mandalay Bay is turning the tables on the last Vegas victims. One of the survivors is up next. They have no interest whatsoever in the victims. They have an, what well, their number one and only priority is, is their money. 58 people were murdered and more than 500 were injured in the Las Vegas massacre last October. And now more than 1,000 survivors of the deadliest shooting in American history are being sued by MGM Resorts. The strange twist is sparking a major backlash. Is this heartless or practical or maybe both? Jonathan Hunt is live in our West Coast newsroom with the story. Hi, Jonathan. 
Hey, Martha, it certainly seems odd on the face of it that the company would sue victims, but it's all about MGM protecting itself from what could potentially be a series of devastating financial claims. The company says it has, quote, no liability of any kind to, to defendants. A couple of Those defendants wild being this some of the hundreds of people who were shot, wounded, and, and traumatized, traumatized that terrible night Center, when a government opened fire first from the Mandalay Bay. It's tough out there. MGM cites a 2002 July federal act that gives wow. liability Giraffes to usually protection begin to any stand company that uses, an quote, anti-terrorism technology or in services that can, quote, help was trying to beat and respond in a to mass pool. violence. Take a look at this. MGM Imagine says that's it's protected from liability in, because it uses a security company certified by the Department of Homeland Security. And, and, and in a no statement, to MGM added, quote, years of drawn-out litigation and hearings are not in the best interest of victims, the community, and the those still Thanks healing. for inviting us now, the act tonight. MGM That's it is for this special report. On here was passed Fair in the wake of the 9-11 terror afraid. attacks. The, story. the FBI has not McCall's called right the right Vegas now. shootings an act of terrorism, and in fact it still hasn't found a motive behind you, Brad, the massacre. Good to see you tonight. Victims All right, and their this lawyers evening, Bill are outraged. Who was once the West's biggest this is the most reprehensible conduct by a defendant under circumstances like this I've ever witnessed in that he may become part of some kind of exchange underway for 12 Russian intelligence. Brought After his huge arsenal of weapons into the Mandalay we Bay, MGM should have seen the warning signs of the and should States, not be protected the legally by that 2002 Federal Safety Act. We can let them into the country and they will be it present to this question. To then we for would a expect hotel casino that the Americans would reciprocate uh, and we had can bring up inefficient the security Mr. Process Browder that didn't, in this particular you know, all case. All the bells and whistles are going and off that they didn't catch. Now, the courts will decide the legal issues. The court of public opinion, Martha, seems to have ruled already against MGM. That Martha? could be damaging as well. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Brian Claypool, an attorney who was there the night of the massacre, he represents more than 75 of the survivors. And Mark Eiglarsh, a criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor. Gentlemen, welcome, uh, both of you. Mark, Hi, uh, you were there. We talked shortly after that night about how horrific it was for you. Um, you know, how does, how does MGM turn its lawsuits against these victims and get away with it? Hey, Martha, thanks for having me back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked right after the shooting, and I will tell you that, that, that the announcement of these lawsuits against the victims of the Vegas shooting has re-victimized uh, and re-traumatized everybody that was part of that shooting, including myself. And, and my question to MGM is, how, how deep into this swamp do they want to go by suing victims? I mean, how low do they want to kick the victims? In my opinion, both as a victim uh, of the shooting and a lawyer, uh, I'm, and actually I'm co-counseling with Robert Eglett on these cases, I mean, th this is a bullying tactic and an intimidation tactic, Martha, yeah. to dissuade or discourage these victims from filing this lawsuit, yeah. plain and simple. You and know, they didn't have to do this. Uh, Mark, I can understand if MGM thinks that, you know, they can win this suit, but suing the victims, what are they suing them for? A PR nightmare. I will not defend them on PR, ni on, on PR grounds at all. My heart goes out to the victims, and I can understand why Brian and the others are feeling angry. However, Brian, as a tremendous trial lawyer, knows that your job when you're defending someone is to do everything you possibly can to win. And in this particular case, they cite a statute that seems to be created for this very scenario. They didn't hire Justin Bieber's bodyguards or a couple of Hell's Angels. They hired a company that was certified by the Department of Homeland Security in the exact acts that are protected underneath this statute. I'm not sure how a judge doesn't grant this. All right, but this, let me ask uh, you this, because after, after this horrific night, we talked about the security that other casinos have in place in Las Vegas. And the Wynn Casino, as I remember, had some much tougher security in terms of what you can bring into those rooms and how long you can let them, you know, no one enter your room for days and days. So if you can prove that, can you prove, Brian, that they were negligent because other resorts have handled it much better? You, you can do that. And, and you can also, the way we're going to do it also is, for example, a couple weeks ago, uh, there was evidence uh, of three years ago, a convicted felon is in the hotel room at the Mandalay Bay. 
with mass weapons. So we can use we can use prior reports of crime at all the MGM uh, casinos and try to get in evidence of other crime.